Okay, so now that you've had some practice with the Lewis structure and identifying the valence electrons for atoms or elements, we're now going to speculate what must happen in order for an atom to bond. So, you should be able to tell how and what type of bond will be formed with different combinations of elements as target 41. So if I give you two elements, you should be able to tell me how they're going to bond. The first type of bond is ionic bond. We already wrote down that ionic bonds occur between a metal and a non-metal, and they gain or lose electrons. So the best way to understand ionic bond is to show an example. So let's take a look at this website that's going to show, you, show us how ionic bonds work. Okay, so the box contains two negatively, negatively charged atoms, or ions. If you try to uh, drag them closer together, they repel each other. So like charges repel, different charges attract. So positive and negative attract, like charges repel. All right, so let's see how this applies to ionic charges. Okay, so atoms on the left side of the periodic table form positive ions. That means they usually give away electrons. And if you lose electrons, that means you have more protons, so you become positively charged. Atoms on the right side of the periodic table form negative ions. That means they gain those electrons, so they have more electrons than protons, so they become negatively charged. So they're the anions. <coughs> All right, so we're going to choose a metal and a nonmetal, or one that's a cation and an anion. We're going to choose sodium and chlorine as um, our two elements. All right, um, let's see. Uh, let's see if we're going to do the Lewis dot structure. Okay, they didn't. Okay, so sodium has one valence electron. Chlorine has seven. So let's go back to my picture or my notes. Okay, so if we were to draw all the electrons that sodium has to fit in the first outer shell, then you've got eight and so forth until you get one valence electron. So it for it wants to give away that one valence electron. All right, chlorine has seven valence electrons. It only needs one more electron to be stable. So, it wants to get an electron from a metal. Okay, so if you look here, there's two and then eight, that's ten. That means there's one electron on the outer level. So, what happens is sodium is going to give that electron to chlorine. When that happens, that electron is going to come over here from sodium and join chlorine. Okay, so when sodium loses that one electron, it now has eight in its second, and it's the, the next energy level. So it's full, it's happy. Chlorine gained that electron, now it has eight in the outer shell, and chlorine's happy. So sodium becomes a plus one, because it now has one more proton than electrons. Chlorine becomes a negative one because it gained an electron so it now has one more electron than proton so when you write that out as a compound you write that as na cl the na is a plus cl is negative so that's an ionic bond now i'm going to do one more example so that you can understand how it works, we're going to take another metal, we're going to take magnesium, and we're going to bond it with oxygen. Okay, and form magnesium oxide. Okay, magnesium is an alkali earth metal, so it has two valence electrons. Oxygen has six valence electrons. So oxygen needs two to be happy, Magnesium needs to lose those two so that it can become happy as well. So if we were to draw the Lewis diagram for magnesium and oxygen, it would look like this. 
So magnesium is going to give two of its electrons over to oxygen. Once it loses those two electrons, the next energy shell has eight. So magnesium's happy. Now oxygen has eight electrons in its outer shell, so it's also happy. So you write that as magnesium oxide. Magnesium, because it gave away two electrons, becomes positively charged by two. Because it has more protons now than electrons. Oxygen, because it gained two electrons, is negatively charged. Now, sometimes ionic bonds aren't perfect. One element bonding with another element. For example, let's look at lithium and oxygen. Lithium has a valence electron of one. Oxygen and valence electrons of six. Now, lithium can only give, each lithium atom can only give one electron. So if this lithium atom gives oxygen this electron, oxygen is still not happy. That's why it takes two atoms of lithium to bond with one atom of oxygen. So you would write this as Li lithium 2, that subscript 2, oxygen 1. And that lets you know that compound, in order for it to work, takes two atoms of lithium to bond with one atom of oxygen. Okay, so whoops, <laughs> now let's go to our covalent bonds. And again, you're going to get a lot of practice with these as your left-hand activity. Okay, so let's take a look at covalent bonds. Remember, covalent bonds happen with the elements on the right-hand side of the staircase because covalent bonds only exist between nonmetals. Okay, covalent bonds, they don't gain or lose electrons, they share them. So let's take a look at hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen is a nonmetal. It has one valence electron. So what happens is hydrogen likes to bond with other hydrogen atoms. And to do that, they will share these two electrons. So if these, remember, the first energy level only needs two to be happy. So if hydrogen gave away this electron, then that hydrogen would be happy, but this hydrogen atom wouldn't. wouldn't. So what they do is they share the electrons, and they form a hydrogen molecule that looks like this. Okay, now, because they're sharing those electrons, and they are the same nonmetal, they do not have a charge. And you're going to see why in a minute. Okay, fluorine has seven valence electrons. So when fluorine atoms share electrons, they share the two, one from each fluorine, Okay, to make an F2. Okay, now let's look at two different nonmetals. Let's look at carbon and oxygen to form CO2. So carbon has four valence electrons. Oxygen only has six. So if you'll notice here, two of carbon's atoms are bonding with one oxygen atom. Now oxygen has six valence, or I'm sorry, eight valence electrons, see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So now oxygen is happy. Then carbon will form another bond with oxygen, another one. Same thing, oxygen has um, <clears throat> eight valence electrons. Carbon now has eight as well, two, four, six, eight. So you write that as C, O, Two. Now, there is one thing I want to talk about when atoms share electrons. You can also show how they share like this. The carbon in the center, oxygen on this side, another oxygen on this side. If you only share one pair of electrons, then that's represented by a double line. Okay? If you share two, then you give it a double line. Now, carbon shares two with this oxygen, two with that. So you would draw a double bond. That's called a double bond because carbon is sharing two, two electrons with oxygen. 
If it was only sharing one pair, then that would be a solid line. So for example, up here, for hydrogen, it forms what's called a single bond because there's only one pair of electrons that are being shared between the two hydrogen atoms. So this is one pair that's represented by a solid line. Same thing with fluorine. It forms a single bond with another fluorine atom. But with the case of carbon and oxygen, because there are two pairs, that's called a double bond. So you denote that with two lines with each oxygen atom. Okay, another example is fluorine with carbon. Okay, now this gets kind of crazy because fluorine has seven valence electrons, carbon has four. So it takes four fluorine atoms to bond with one carbon. So you would write that as CF4. Okay, now notice carbon is only sharing one pair of electrons with each fluorine atom. So if you were to draw this out, you would write carbon in the center and this would show you that it's sharing electrons with each fluorine atom and that's a single bond. So carbon forms a single bond with four fluorine atoms. That's how you would draw it out. Just like that. Now covalent bonds can be categorized as polar or nonpolar. A polar bond is a covalent bond between two different nonmetals. They share those shared electrons will actually gravitate or move toward the atom with the most protons. And then atoms start to have charges. Water is the most common polar covalent bond. So if you look at water, water is H two up. It takes two atoms of hydrogen to bond with one atom of oxygen because hydrogen has one valence electron, oxygen has six, so hydrogen there needs to be two of them to give one electron to carbon, or not give but share with oxygen. So what happens is oxygen forms a single bond with each hydrogen atom. Now those shared electrons Remember, electrons are attracted to protons. Oxygen has eight protons. The hydrogen only have one. So those shared electrons will actually gravitate toward oxygen because it has a stronger, has more protons, so it has a stronger positive charge. So it will pull those shared electrons toward oxygen. So then what you get is a polar molecule where, if we draw it out like this, oxygen becomes negatively charged, hydrogen becomes positively charged. I drew that a little big. And remember I talked about this before at the beginning of the year. It's called the Mickey Mouse molecule. This is why water has what we call surface tension because if you group a lot of oxygen molecules together then another water molecule, that oxygen, is going to be attracted to the hydrogen. Same thing over here. When that occurs, it creates spaces. That should actually connect. I just couldn't get it. I'm just going to start drawing the circles. Okay. And you're going to see this is going to create spaces in between how the uh, water molecules sit together. And then there's going to be two blue on top. Okay, so right there you have one, two, three, four water molecules that are attracted to each other based on their polarity. Because remember, oxygen has a negative charge because those shared electrons gravitate toward it. The hydrogens have a positive charge. Okay, so when water molecules get attracted to each other, they create a space in between here because of how they're set up because of the single bonds between oxygen and hydrogen. That empty space allows matter with very little mass like animals like spiders to simply walk on water or not break these bonds. So these bonds are there that are attracting the positive to the negative 
And if you have very little mass, you won't break those bonds and you can walk on water. Unfortunately for us, we have a lot of mass, so we break through those bonds really quickly. But that's what a polar uh, covalent bond looks like. A nonpolar covalent bond is between the same nonmetal. It has no charge because the elements have equal numbers of protons. So if you take chlorine, chlorine has uh, 17 protons, 17 protons. So those shared electrons just sit in the middle because they're not, they don't gravitate to one or the other because they have the same charge. Okay, unlike hydrogen and chlorine. Those shared electrons, hydrogen has one electron, chlorine, I'm sorry, one proton, chlorine has 17 protons, so those shared electrons are going to gravitate toward the chlorine atom, polar, nonpolar. The last type of bonding is going to be called a metallic bond. This is a bond that occurs between two metals. They share or pull electrons. Okay, so let me show this clip. Okay, so let's take a look at copper and zinc. They both have, are metals, and they're going to form a metallic bond. If you add copper and zinc together, that bond creates brass. Okay, so copper and zinc have few electrons in their outer shells. Copper has one, zinc has two. You can see that copper has the two turquoise, zinc, and, and the yellow has the uh, one. So what happens when metal metallic bonds form? It's like a swimming pool, where if you guys have ever gone swimming in your pool, all of you are sharing the same water, you're swimming around near each other, you might bump and collide into people. Well, that's kind of what happens with metallic bonding. It forms, instead of a swimming pool, it forms an electron cloud, which is a negatively charged cloud that pulls on the atoms, which are positively charged. Okay, the pull between the electron clouds and the atoms bind the atoms together. So if you notice, these two electrons versus this one electron, all these electrons are creating a charged electron cloud that is being shared by all the atoms in this enclosed area, which is like a swimming pool. And that's what it looks like. The electron cloud moves freely in a particular direction when a voltage is applied, so when electricity goes through. The movement of electrons is an electric current. So this is why metals, especially metals that form bonds, can conduct electricity. And they're a good conductor of heat. So that's a metallic bond. So now I've gone over the three ways that atoms can bond. They can bond by metallic, covalent, and ionic. So you are now going to get a lot of practice with how atoms bond. So basically, I should be able to give you elements on the periodic table. You should be able to tell me their valence electrons. And then based on that information, whether they are a metal or a non-metal, you should be able to tell me what type of bond will form and you're going to get some practice with that.